they, like <laughs> scripture says, you know, we make our plans, but God directs our steps. So I'm a That's firm right. believer of that. Youth Worker Nation, this is Doug again, and it's great to have you here with Youth Worker on Fire. And we have with us Chad Canfield. And Chad, I've known Chad since high school, yeah. probably ran into him in middle school. Yes. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but he's had quite a history of good and great things happening in his life. Great family. I remember your mom and dad just really mm -hmm. being encouragement uh, to you all through those years. It was very obvious, and also obvious that they were your biggest fan. <laughs> without a doubt. Yeah, without a doubt. <laughs> and so um, uh, Eustace High School and grew up in this area, went to a church called First Baptist at that time, yep. and now it's called Life Point, Life Point. Uh, since you were about eight years old. Yeah. Went to Eustace High, and I think you spent a little time at Apopka. Did you go to Apopka I did. for a year? Yep, I transferred my junior year. I junior went to Apopka. Year. Okay, Correct. Couple, and then Florida State. Yep, I actually went to Florida, redshirted there for a year. Okay, and then went to Florida State. Oh, that is crazy. Exactly. And, but you played at Florida played State. Played at both schools. Yes. You played at both schools. Both schools. Oh yes. my goodness. Yes. And and what was the difference? Um, you know, I always I always laugh and joke. I say that uh, we were spoiled a lot more at Florida than we were at Florida State oh. in terms of our training table, the medical staff. I mean, we had a massage therapist, chiropractors, everything. At Florida oh State, goodness. you didn't have that. You just oh. kind of had to fend for yourself. And I, I think that's why they're, they've always been a, uh, a little bit tougher than the Gators, in my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, they're going, uh, no, we're going to see how tough you can be. Exactly. Oh, wow. Exactly. Wow. I never knew that. Yeah. I mean, I, Most and I've don't. interviewed – football players uh, and sports guys from both schools yep and i never knew that that's a little hidden secret maybe they weren't you know they that's right let the it guys out, on the florida side that never went to florida state they're not going to say that no. <laughs> they go oh no we're the top. sorry guys we're, we're the top <laughs> we're, we're the guy. you know but uh and so and then you ended up in banking i did and then uh in investment banking yep financial advisor that's right so now, now let's go back and tell me this tell me yeah. well just catch us up to date from then to now whatever you want to tell us and give us a little bit about your personal life yeah so we went uh the biggest uh one of the biggest hurdles was going out to houston and going through the stem cell because it's four months you actually have to stay out there so mm -hmm. we had to, my mom and i had to rent an apartment and you're out there for four months, and it's it's pretty rough. It's a pretty rough process. Uh, I would say that's probably one of the worst um, health situations that I had to go through, even worse than the beginning chemo. It just uh, really took it out. I mean, I had a couple really bad days, and mm -hmm. quite honestly, I didn't know if I was going to pull through, but um, I did, and um, I've since recovered phenomenally. They just um, th The doctors are still in amazement here in Orlando and at MD Anderson. They just they say that they do about 3,200 stem cell transplants a year at MD Anderson, and mm -hmm. they They've never seen anybody recover as fast and as well as I have. So I give all the glory to God. And, uh, That's right. And mm -hmm. I've also taken really good care of myself physically and mm -hmm. uh, through my diet, nutrition. And I think that uh, that obviously played a big role in it well as far as and also the support of my family, yeah. which is yeah. second to none, as you mentioned, they're my biggest fans. For yes. Sure. Yeah. But and, and the way we keep running into each other is uh, in the gym. In the gym. You know, we look so much alike, you know. And, of and, course. Uh, you know, I just uh, I, I'm just about as strong as you. That's I'm not, telling you, and don't get it twisted. Close. This this not guy's a, close. he's a he's a beast in the gym. So don't get it <laughs> twisted right here. I've seen him work out. He's pretty. Yeah. Uh, he's pretty intense. Oh, I don't I don't know about that. But but. Uh, <laughs> they'll get a good laugh out of this. Okay. <laughs> but anyway, uh, but anyway, seeing you in there uh, a few times, we went and seen each other in years. Yeah. And the next thing I know, you're going for cancer treatment. Yeah. I mean, and uh, you had not, I don't believe when I first started seeing you, you had found any of that out. No. But, um, uh, tell me about, let's go back though. Tell me about when you, it was in high school when your mom had cancer. Yep. She got diagnosed. Uh, that was, um, we were talking, you know, when you and I were talking about some questions that you may have asked, that was the, uh, I would say that was probably one of the, that was the worst point in my life, um, was, was here. It was finding out that she had, uh, had cancer. And, uh, if she would have do nothing, she maybe had three to five months to live. Oh my. So that yeah. hit our family really hard. That was in, in the year 2000, 2001, right before graduating mm. um, from Apopka. Mm -hmm. So we got that news dropped on us and, uh, hit us obviously pretty hard, but she's a, she's a tough cookie. So I'm, yeah. you know, there's not too many models like her these days and she fought through it. It was really hard for our family, but, um, you know, it was, uh, we were very blessed at the same time that she's, she was went into remission fairly quickly and has been so for the past 12 years. Yeah. So let's talk about your best uh, time in life. 
tell me about your best. Uh, so, and, and you know what? Yeah. Uh, let's go back first. Okay. Other than your parents, who was that one person in middle school, high school, or college that stands out that was uh, a mentor in your life, whether they wanted to be or not, that that just, you know, flipped a switch in your brain of this is where I want to go in life? So besides outside of, of, of like you mentioned, my parents of, of being just incredible. Yes. I, I mean, I couldn't, I thought about it so much. And it was so funny because, I mean, I started sports in late 80s, early 90s. Yeah. And it's just not one person. So, I mean, I, I thought about it and I figured I'd break it down because there was actually different sports-wise that I focused on. All these coaches touched my life mm -hmm. in one way or another. Okay. So from Tell football, from football starting off in Pop Warner, we had, uh, you know, we had a Pop Warner football, and we were the the Gators here. I don't know if you remember back in that, in oh, that yeah. day. Oh, yeah, yeah. So uh, we, we the Lake Youth Gators, and we had a blast with that. But starting off coach-wise, I had, you know, Coach Stanley was my first coach ever. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're talking about a, I was a country club kid coming in on the football field. I remember yeah. the first day I had on a helmet and shoulder pads, <laughs> and that was it, no other pads. And I was out there tackling, and I got hurt, didn't want to play anymore. And he said, look, man, so he said, you know, you got something special. He said, I know. He said, I know you're tough. I really want you to stick it out. And, um, you know, he helped. He just helped uh, help kind of build, build that perseverance mm -hmm. in a way and determination. And then after him was uh, I had Coach Hooks. I had Coach Willie Jones. I had Coach Jerry Washington. I had Coach um, Johnny Saunders, who you probably know. Johnny's yeah. been in the community for a long time, yes, doing a lot of great things. Um, you know, at uh, at Apopka and Usis, I had Coach Darlington, which was phenomenal. And there's one thing, you know, he's obviously a wonderful Christian man. And one thing that he always never shied away from, especially in this day and age, which, you know, that's a whole other topic. But mm -hmm. um, he always, uh, we prayed before practice, we prayed after practice. Mm -hmm. And one mm -hmm. verse, I think it's Proverbs 22.1, mm -hmm. a good name is to be more desired than great riches, favors better than silver and gold <laughs> i remember that to this day because that's what we said and we and, yeah. and we believed it yeah and uh, and uh, so that from a football standpoint and then going into the collegiate level coach bowden was just an incredible man uh mm. I, my mom was still fighting cancer at that point in time when i was mm. in school i would go up and see him on a regular basis and the first question he'd always do is he'd hug me put his arm around me and ask me how mom was doing Matter of mm -hmm. fact, I saw him 10, 12 years later at a speaking function at LifePoint, and the first question oh, he asked, one. first question yeah. he asked was, "How is your mom doing?" And she tapped him on the shoulder right behind him. Uh, so I mean, <laughs> he just uh, as far as uh, as far as on that side on baseball, I had Coach Lee. Who, you know, he coached at uh, Eustis. Good friend. Uh, yeah. Coach Dennis Mitchell. Mitchell. Um, coach Kenny Carpenter, mm. you know, I had, um, you know, even uh, you know, Coach Wise over at Apopka. I had all those coaches that just help help build a foundation around me and it's with faith uh respect loyalty um drive and all of that i've taken from my sport so i mean i'm, I'm blessed to have been touched it's not just one person yeah. all of those individuals played a key role in my life yeah and, and there are a lot and, and the great thing about that i'm glad coach you said dave that. westgate i have to remember, i have to oh, coach dave, dave westgate yeah. is an incredible individual he is great and uh, great i love man. him to death and Coach Darlington was my neighbor for all this. Oh, there you go. Exactly. Yeah. I remember. That's right. Yeah. I remember you. Exactly. <laughs> it's when right next to right next door, right? Across the street. Across the yeah. street. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Our yep. boys grew up together. Yep. And so, um, w with that being said, the um, uh, one thing Dr. John Maxwell says. I don't know if you've heard of Maxwell. Maxwell. Yeah, he's one of the top leadership guys in the world. And one thing he says, he said, never have one mentor. <laughs> I always shoot for that because yeah. we're looking for adolescents. What's happening in there? Who was that influencer? How do they influence? You and I ask everyone mm -hmm. that question. But the one thing he says, he says, have multiple mentors. He said, if you have one mentor, you're not only get their, going to get their good, you're going to get their bad. And everybody's got good and bad. Exactly. <laughs> it's true. But you have multiple mentors, you can take just the good from all of them. It's true. And so you have all those guys yes, that you're sir. reflecting on. And mm -hmm. uh, all those men are huge uh, uh, men's men. See, they are. Men's man. You they know? are. And they are just uh, th those guys that uh, both have a tender side and are as tough as men can get. Exactly. Exactly. And uh, and to finish it off your your sports career with Bobby Bowden, that's uh, that's an amazing. Thing. Yes, I was blessed with that. And, and uh, guys, if you haven't read um, um, Called Coach, yeah. have you seen that? book? Have you read that book that's yet? That's a good one. Oh yeah. my goodness, one of the, one of the best books that he's written. But being a being a high school student. Yeah, you're an adolescent. I mean, the, the one thing that we know is adolescence goes all the way to about 25 for a guy. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, Sometimes a little more. And a little more. <laughs> <laughs> My wife would say that maybe I haven't grown up yet. But anyway, it's okay. And, <laughs> and then uh, uh, 22 for a girl on the average. So there's a lot of emotions going on. And you, you're a tough guy. I've watched you a lot of years. And even if that's at those times you were tough. But behind closed doors, there had to be times of breaking down. So tell me what life was like at home, the things that you can share. And the reason yeah. we're doing this is because we're looking at youth workers, yeah. that, you know, uh, all kinds of people will listen to this at some time, but are targeted as youth pastors. And they handle situations like this and work with people. So let's talk about those things behind closed doors that, that, that no one knew or that you can talk about that uh, you wish you had had someone, you know, to maybe help you with or talk, talk through. Yeah, you know, um, you know, I, I've been honestly. I mean, I know some people uh, maybe not had the opportunity, but I've been blessed to to be surrounded by coaches. You mentioned, you know, I played a lot of sports: basketball, football, you know, baseball, and um, I was around a lot of a lot of, a lot of coaches that actually uh, were great Christian men, and mm-hmm. uh, they helped build my foundation, you know, within Christ. So it was nice to have that support going forward of of what i what i had to deal with but i mean i mean i'm not gonna lie at the beginning and uh you know it was it was tough you know you're you're angry you don't know why this is happening you know i'm i'm in gr- aggressive at nature so i was obviously an angry angry individual at first and yes. uh you know we were just all all struggling as a family unit of accepting what has happened and um and really just kind of of getting you know every everybody at peace with it mm-hmm. but you know i had i had great coaches that at the time uh coach rick darlington he was at apopka with me when she yeah, got rick well yeah when when i got yeah. when my mom got diagnosed with that and he was always there just asking you know and and praying for us continuously and shelly darlington his wife phenomenal uh a woman on that side and they they gave me a, a lot of support within that time and i never really got a chance to thank them of how much that really meant to me mm-hmm. but it really did so but behind closed doors you know yeah i mean uh, you know as, as a, a grown man i mean i, I cried a lot mm-hmm. um you know i prayed a lot um you know i just was asking why and um you know I, my faith is much stronger and secure now i believe as far as going through those things which was i know it was god's plan but that just helped build it stronger and just mm-hmm. cure that that uh, that situation for me. What was harder, going through your own cancer or going through cancer with your mom? Oh well, tenfold. I mean, I would I would die for my mom and dad in a second. So mm-hmm. my her getting struck with that was was tenfold what I had to go through. Mm-hmm. So I mean, I was like, okay, give it all to me. I'm okay. I'll take it all day long. Mm-hmm. But don't touch her. Please don't touch yeah, her or right. my father. Right. So um, th- that was by far the hardest thing. Mm-hmm. Um, even the, even the second time with the breast cancer, I was just praying, please, just you know. If anything happens, just, you know, uh, is, you know, just take me. They wouldn't want me to say that, but just don't, yeah. don't, you know, let her suffer. Yes. Parents, so. we, it'd, it'd be just the opposite. <laughs> prayer, exactly. Right? I know. I'm sure I'm quite sure it would. We went through that in our family. My wife ended up with breast cancer. My kids were, uh, Ryan, I think was right out of college, uh, right out of high school. And, and uh, my other two were one in high school and one middle school. So uh, we get that oh, whole scene that. and we get the wise. Hey, I'm youth pastor. Yeah. I'm supposed to have all the answers and. I went crazy, you know, yeah. for a while, just going, you know, trying to yeah. make things happen. Yeah. And um, and going through a lot of questions. It doesn't matter what your faith is. You're still going to question. It's true. Uh, and that's a natural process. It's the being able to turn around and see that you have a God. Correct. Th- that that is bigger than the universe and bigger than yourself. Uh, and uh, you still wonder why he doesn't do certain things certain ways, you know. He sure Gee, does. God, we have a better plan over here. What's yeah. up, right? Well, we they, like <laughs> Scripture says, you know, we make our plans, but God directs our steps. So I'm a That's firm right. believer of that. That's right. Firm That's believer right. of that. Let's go back first. Okay. Other than your parents, who was that one person in middle school, high school, or college that stands out that was uh, a mentor in your life, whether they wanted to be or not, that, that just – you know, flip the switch in your brain. Of, this is where I want to go in life. There was actually different sports wise that I focused on. All these coaches touched my life mm-hmm. in one way or another. OK, so from Tell football, from football, starting off in Pop Warner, we had, uh, you know, we had a Pop Warner football. and We were the, the Gators here. I don't know if you remember back in that. In oh, that yeah. Day. Yeah. So uh, we, we the Lake Youth Gators and we had a blast with that. But starting off coach wise, I had 
you know, Coach Stanley was my first coach ever. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're talking about I was a country club kid coming in on the football field. I remember the first day I had on a helmet and shoulder pads, (laughs) and that was it, no other pads. And I was out there tackling, and I got hurt, didn't want to play anymore. And he said, look, man, so he said, you know, you got something special. He said, I know know you're tough. I really want you to stick it out. And, um, you know, he helped. He just helped uh, help kind of build build that perseverance mm-hmm. in a way and determination. And then after him was uh, I had Coach Hooks, I had Coach Willie Jones, I had Coach Jerry Washington, I had Coach um, Johnny Saunders. Who you probably know Johnny. Yeah. He's been in the community for a long time, yes, doing a lot of great things. Um, you know, at uh, at Apopka and Usis, I had Coach Darlington, which was phenomenal. And there's one thing, you know, he's obviously a wonderful Christian man. And one thing that he always never shied away from, especially in this day and age, which, you know, that's a whole nother topic. But mm-hmm. um, he always, uh, we prayed before practice, we prayed after practice. Mm-hmm. And one mm-hmm. verse, I think it's Proverbs 22, 1, mm-hmm. a good name is to be more desired than great riches, favor is better than silver and gold. Mm-hmm. I remember that to this day because <laughs> that's what we said and we and, yeah. and we believed it. Yeah. And uh, and uh, so that from a football standpoint and then going into the collegiate level, Coach Bowden was just an incredible man. Uh, mm. I, my mom was still fighting cancer at that point in time when I was mm. in school. I would go up and see him on a regular basis. And the first question he'd always do is he'd hug me, put his arm around me and ask me how mom was doing. Matter mm-hmm. of fact, I saw him 10, 12 years later at a speaking function at LifePoint. First question yeah. he asked was, how is your mom doing? And she tapped him on the shoulder right behind him. Uh, so, I mean, he just, uh, as far as uh, as far as on that side, on baseball, I had Coach Lee, who, you know, he coached at uh, Eustace. Good friend, uh, yeah. Coach Dennis Mitchell, Mitchell um, Coach Kenny Carpenter. Mm. You know, I had, um, you know, even, uh, you know, Coach Wise over at Apopka. I had all those coaches that just help, help build a foundation around me. And it's with faith, uh, respect, loyalty. Um, drive and all of that I've taken from my sport. So I mean, I'm I'm blessed to have been touched. It's not just one person. Yeah. All of those individuals played a key role in my life. Yeah, and, and there are a lot. And, and the great thing about that, I'm glad Coach you said Dave that. Westgate. I have to. I have to. Oh, Coach Dave, Dave Westgate yeah. is an incredible individual. He is great. And uh, great I love man. him to death. And Coach Darlington was my neighbor for all the. Oh, there you go. Exactly. Yeah. I remember. That's right. Yeah. I remember you exactly. <laughs> it's went right next to right next door, right? Cross the street. Cross yeah. street. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Our yep. boys grew up together. Yep. And so. Um, with that being said, the um, uh, one thing Dr. John Maxwell says, I don't know if you've heard of Maxwell. But Maxwell, yeah, he's one of the top leadership guys in the world. And one thing he says, he said, never have one mentor. <laughs> I always shoot for that because yeah. we're looking for adolescents, what's happening in there, who was that influence, or how do they influence you? And I ask everyone mm-hmm. that question. But the one thing he says, he says, have multiple mentors. He said, if you have one mentor, you're not only get their, going to get their good, you're going to get their bad, and everybody's got good and bad. Exactly. <laughs> it's true. But you have multiple mentors, you can take just the good from all of them. It's true. And so you have all those guys yes, that you're sir. reflecting on, and mm-hmm. uh, all those men are huge uh, uh, men's men. Yeah, they are. Men's man. You they know? are. And they are just uh, those guys that uh, both have a tender side and are as tough as men can get. Exactly. Exactly. And, uh, and to finish it off, your, your sports career with Bobby Bowden, that's uh, that's an amazing. Thing. Yes, I was blessed with that. And uh, guys, if you haven't read um, um, "Called to Coach," yeah. have you seen that book? Have you read that book that's yet? That's a good one. Oh yep. my goodness, one of the, one of the best books that he's written. He's written many books, yep. but uh, "Called to Coach," and so uh, best moment in life. Okay, so I, you know, I thought about that some. Uh, I always, you know, think about that sometimes, and uh, you know, I had a lot of time to reflect in the hospital. And oh whatnot. yes. Um, you know, I'd say, and and not to. Uh, you know, not that it's cliche or anything. I think my two there's two best moments in my life that I can remember back, even as being a little child. Um, the first one is just, you know, you were going through as a Christian. Uh, you know, you're you're you know believing that God died for us. You know, on His he sacrificed His Son Jesus on the cross for our sins. But I really always kind of was going through the motions. But mm-hmm. I got to a point where I was just like. I would say this is before I had gotten sick, so this is probably about five, six years ago, where I was at a point and I was just felt like I was kind of going through the motions, and then I, I really got um, just down on my knees and just started praying in my faith. And when I really, really thought about God died for me and my sins, mm-hmm. He loved me so much, not just as a as a group and all of us or whatever. That was a really turning point in my life and it changed my perspective in a lot of ways. So that was a huge moment for me. One of the best moments, obviously of accepting that and just living it. And then the second moment is just knowing I was, um, 
you know, you're when you're little, you know, you love your parents and everything, you know, they love you. But there's certain things in life that uh, just knowing, I mean, you could say it's a moment. It was a moment for me where knowing that my parents love me so much unconditionally that, I mean, I had a, a moment where I was at MD Anderson. And I just, you know, uh, you know, kind of choked me up a little bit and broke down. But just knowing that moment right there that how much they love me and how blessed I was. For me, those were two moments. Do you, do you remember uh, what what day or what year of life that was for you when that just when that hit? So I got baptized just before I left on uh, October. I think it was twenty fourth on that side before I left to MD Anderson. Okay. Um, before that, prior to that, so this was in fourteen, mm-hmm. uh, two thousand fourteen. I went through a, a pretty a pretty tough breakup. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was a really, really, uh, tough situation to go through, but that would be the moment, uh, within that year that really just turned my life around in, uh, pastor Rick, uh, pew was, uh, my right hand man. I mean, he just, uh, he just loved on me and, um, brought me to a great, um, I guess you could call it a Bible study or workbook. Mm -hmm. Probably you've heard it as far as experiencing God. Mm -hmm. Uh, It was phenomenal. It touched my life in so many different ways and really, really cleared a lot of questions that I had up and just it helped me out a lot yeah and Rick was a good youth pastor uh, sure a good was. pastor for you because uh, he was all all football he exactly was a football guy yep. a good or guy unfortunately but <laughs> yeah. you know I don't hold that against him <laughs> I understand I understand <laughs> but um the uh who was your youth pastor at that time when you're in high school uh, middle let's school see. high school um middle school high school you know to be honest uh with middle school I'm trying to think I don't think we really had, we didn't have anybody specifically that I remember that really stood out, um, you know, even um, sports-wise or in, in the school. FCA here at the high school, mm-hmm. I know that, um, you know, it wasn't mandatory, but a lot of kids attended. And I know uh, Coach Darlington was was really big on, um, on you know, offering people that, you know, hey, we yeah. have these things in that nature. So whomever at the point in time, I know um, Rodney Mashburn, uh, was uh, he was uh, he did some things with FCA as well yeah, as he was yeah, a strength coach for a while. You remember Rodney? Yeah, yeah. He's, still, he's at Life Point as well. Yeah. But yeah. Um, so those individuals, I would say, are the ones that stick out the most to me in my more so high school days that really helped, um, you know, kind of uh, share the word, mm-hmm. um, which you know these days doesn't happen as much as I would love to it to happen these days. But that's I would say those two individuals, um, especially uh, like I said, Coach Darlington. Yeah, was yeah. very big on that. Yeah, that's that's good. Yeah, that's good. Well, tell us, give us, um, what are some of the books that you use for inspiration, or, or whether it's a book, periodical, whether it's uh, uh, a particular speaker, movie, um, or some of all of those. What what are some things that you'd recommend for guys that are trying to lead students? Yeah, you know, um, that's that's a that's a that's a great uh, students a great and question. their staff, right? Yeah, because I mean, it, it applies to everybody, uh, and you know, it's. I mean, I've come across all kinds of different movies. One movie that I'll, I mean, I'll never forget. I actually did a report even on college is the, uh, uh, the Passion of Christ. Mm-hmm. Uh, with that one on that side, that was such a such a powerful movie for me. But as far as inspirational books, like I had mentioned, uh, Experiencing God, mm-hmm. just that that by far was probably the most impactful um, study guide, workbook, whatever you want to call it, that I had ever even come close to cracking in my yeah, life. So that yeah. was huge. I've read other other books like The Purpose Driven Life. Mm-hmm. which was very uh Rick Warren exactly right. very uh, it was a very good uh content in there that I've taken with me um other books um um you know Pastor Rick or whatever he has his book this mm-hmm. hope mm-hmm. with this hope foundation mm-hmm. uh which I work closely with him with very very uh inspirational book for me just to kind of especially someone so close to me seeing the adversity and how they got through it mm-hmm. and uh, it's always nice to I enjoy seeing um Movies, whether they're faced with adversity, uh, how they get through it, especially when it's faith driven. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, that really, um, you know, kind of appeals to me on that side. Yeah. But book wise, without a doubt. And I tell I mean, there's tons of uh, um, uh, friends and family that I've uh, I've shared that with. Uh, let's let's cover a couple things now. Also, one is the foundation. Give us a little more detail about rick's foundation rick pew yeah. but also let's talk about what you and your father are doing about um, uh, the correctional system and what you're doing on the medical end there okay? yes so uh you know i was i was fortunate to uh, uh I, I was involved in telemedicine um back when i finished grad school in 2007 2008 mm-hmm. and telemedicine is uh you know has changed and evolved a lot since then 
But um, just a, a brief explanation, like I was telling you, it's it's no different than you seeing your regular physician, you know, going into the doctor's office and him evaluating you, looking in your eyes, ears, throat, skin, you know, EKG. Mm-hmm. So all that can be done over the web. So mm-hmm. through web-based technology, high-definition cameras and all the peripherals, stethoscopes and things of that nature, the visit is uh, can be done anywhere pretty much. So um, that's where we started off. It was more focused internationally at that point. Uh, Mm -hmm. rewind forward uh, about 10, 12 years. Um, I was out in actually Houston. Mm -hmm. My dad was researching a company and we found out and got back into the telemedicine piece again. And uh, I'm now acting as uh, president CEO of that. And uh, it's very promising. It's a very great area to help, especially with so many healthcare issues out there today Mm -hmm. for all individuals. But you had mentioned the correctional system, Mm -hmm. very unique as as, uh, many people may not know, but there's obviously just as much need for healthcare as you and I have. That's right. Um, but it's yeah. on it's on a, it's on a great level. Um, so they're 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 coming through a lot of issues now, especially with inmates getting older. They're having a lot of chronic care issues, and these healthcare costs are astronomical, and they impact you and I because that's our tax money and things of that nature that are going to that. That's right. So we're trying to streamline that, make it more cost effective, efficient, higher quality healthcare, and better management. And uh, I believe uh, that we're on the the right path and the right road. God willing. What is the uh, how would that help us? Let's say in the private sector in the United States. Was that going to enter, you think, the yes. correctional before it does the private sector in the United States? I mean, we know it's in Europe, mm-hmm. but uh, what, are, what are the hurdles that we're jumping through to get it into the private sector of the United States? Yep. So the, to- the, 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 uh, the grand scheme of the telemedicine on that side, uh, the 30,000-foot view, it's been going on for quite some time um, in different um, uh, different areas. Uh, private sector, um, it's been the government utilized it, but the way that technology has obviously, um, you know, changed and evolved over the years, it's made it much easier. But the public side, we focus on both. So we do public and we do the correctional side, government, state, private prisons as well. Mm-hmm. So the biggest thing is is the fact of as as a whole, let's just focus on the United States. We have a there's a tremendous uh, shortage of physicians yeah. compared to the amount of patients that are out there and the type of care. Yes. So this just gives them the ability to multiply themselves further, especially in the rural areas. So let's just mm-hmm. take, for instance, one of our clients in North Dakota. Mm-hmm. Well, there's not many physicians that might want to freeze the majority of the year in North <laughs> Dakota, right? <laughs> right? So it's a beautiful area, but it's cold. But there's a lot of so what this does is gives those individuals there the ability to have that knowledge, those practices, procedures, treatment from anybody in the world, basically, Mm -hmm. they can have that right at their fingertips. Yeah. Um, So that's in in itself is huge. Physicians are not always the best at keeping schedules. Yeah, exactly. We know that. Because because they're and they're caregivers and I've worked with a lot of them. And so the one thing about them, when you are a caregiver, you're more concerned about the individual and everything that it takes to take care of that. Than you are a schedule. Yeah. Uh, you know, you, that's why you have an office staff that's trying to push exactly. you along. Exactly. But with this, uh, now it doesn't matter where you are. It's not interrupting their life as well as your life to where you can. Yes. And you know what? Sometimes I think that you're, you're able to see better with our technology, you know, looking down the throat sometimes with the naked eye and as opposed to l- looking at the video you just took of that yep. where you can enhance it, you can enlarge it, you can do all those things. Yeah, right there. You hit the nail on the head. It's yeah. true because now these cameras are shooting. Uh, pretty soon, we'll be shooting 4K. Yeah, and literally, you can see better than the human eye can through the video camera. And most people don't know, pro- almost 80 percent of a diagnosis is visual, anyways. Mm-hmm. Uh, the rest comes with scans and diagnostic testing. Exactly. So if you can visually see somebody, mm-hmm. talk with them, communicate, that's that can that can be almost 80 percent of the diagnosis. Now how does that cut down on our cost, though? So what that does, so from a standpoint of obviously, if you can see more patients. And uh, like, for instance, in institutions that we use, they spread that cost over all of them. So when they get, uh, uh, let's just say they put, we put a, a program or like we're going to do a pilot program here. They're doing it in one institution and then they'll multiple it in six. So when we start to grow that, the actually cost comes down because we're actually seeing more patients, mm-hmm. uh, not getting them through fast. Like you said, where there are some physicians that just want to get them in and out, spending time with them. And um, but the biggest thing is the actual um, management of the care. Mm-hmm. It puts accountability on the patient 
as well as the physician mm-hmm. because they're they're talking to the patient they're re- scheduling right there at the end of that telemedicine visit they're scheduling the follow up the uh, patient is has a printout of what they need to do as far as the you know the treatment plan mm-hmm. their scripts are printed out right there so all of that what it's going to do over time it's going to bring down costs because we're going to be more proactive with the healthcare thus eliminating these you know, catastrophic issues that if we were more proactive instead of being reactive, mm-hmm. we'd be better off in the long run. So from a health standpoint, that'll bring it down as well as the physicians. We go out there and we actually create our own network and we can drive down the amount that, um, you know, we're, you know, paying physicians and things of that nature because we're saying, well, look here, here's this group right here. We can utilize your time. It's much more efficient. Mm-hmm. You're not having to worry about, you know, all this other stuff in your office. They could sit in their own house with their laptop and sit here and do visits. So it's a lot more streamlined. And I think that coupled with everything else will definitely impact and bring down those costs. Well, and I'm thinking of now all these youth pastors. I remember all the trips that I take in Colorado and in Gatlinburg, in Mexico, and here you got a sick kid. Yep. And now you can get in touch with their doctor. Yep, exactly. I mean, that's my thought yeah, on it's this. 100%. And there's mobile units that you can actually take in a little suitcase. It's big enough to put on the plane. And you could. all you have to have is power um, and you know some type of Internet source. Yeah. And then someone there to work the peripheral, someone that has some type of little bit of medical knowledge to do a stethoscope and things of that nature. And that's all you need. And I used to tell people that if I had a medical personnel, whether they were, you know, army medic or somebody like that, or a dentist, a doctor, a nurse, doctors usually didn't want to go with us. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. uh, <laughs> you know, or, or paramedic or whatever, I would pay for those guys to go if they were available. Of course. Because they were worth their weight in gold to me when we were on a trip like that. Yep. Because at least it was a medical eye. It was uh, exactly. more than I had. Very crucial. And it's important, too, like you said, that a lot of those physicians, the same way in the correctional side, mm. they don't really want to go to the prison. They would much rather do, you know, take care of patients outside. Very of intimidating, yeah. very time consuming to. I mean, I've gone through the process to visit people. It's unnerving. It is. I don't like it. Yeah. And yeah. then uh, the doctors are going through those things unless they're called to do that as a full time gig. Mm-hmm. But still, like you say, very expensive. Yeah. Here we go. Now we got a whole nother process. Well, that's great, man. Yeah. Uh, I would have never known that had we not done this interview or if I would, it'd be a long time from now. Yeah. Uh, that I knew that about you and about those things. And I think youth pastors, youth workers, coaches need to know this. Parents need to know this. Yes. Uh, about these possibilities and uh, now are you the only company doing this um, no there's there's a few companies out there in the country uh, in the United States that do it as far as doing it the way we do it um, it's it's different um, mm-hmm. we, we the beauty behind ours I think I kind of took it from my financial advisor background is yeah. being able to tailor to each individual so each client we can actually tailor those needs customize however many hours they need from a physician do they need specialists uh we have the possibility of actually bringing four individuals on at one time within within a telemedicine conference piece where all the individuals can see each other and communicate so Mm -hmm. your general physician can talk to your oncologist neurologist things of that nature is very different uh so that and as well as our platform is very unique because it's not software that you have to download on computers it's all web-based yeah which is really nice so you can take it anywhere with you you have your own dedicated hipaa hipaa compliant cloud Mm -hmm. that's out there and it saves all your records all your scans everything of all your patients or or employees whomever it is on that side and uh it's very unique compared to what else is out there but there are some Mm -hmm. but um I think we're doing a little bit different on our end. That's good. That's yeah. good. And, uh, you know, and there's always competition is good. And I think about some of the uh, the visits with doctors and different things like that. And um, uh, there's somewhere I was going with that. I know that we ran into when we were, um, uh, my wife's going to have surgery. We had the best surgeon, literally, because we were looking for the best surgeon for her. Because you know how it is with your mom. Of course. You're going through that and how you felt about all that and how they felt about you. Of course, you're going to go to MD Anderson. If you can afford MD Anderson that, or your insurance can, you're going to go to MD Anderson in Houston because that's you got MD Anderson here, yep. but that's the big boy. You so, know. so there you go. So there's 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 my vision where so we have MD Anderson, which is it uh, it was out the statistics or whatever was ranked among highest. It's the best cancer institution mm-hmm. in the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it just came out with statistics. So now what we can do with telemedicine, we could take that knowledge and then take it to wherever you're at in Orlando. My doctor. Those individuals right there can devise whatever type of plan Mm -hmm. uh, with the chemotherapies and things of that nature, helping them administer it, and then the follow-ups are right there, so you don't even have to leave your state. So that's what, you know, on the public side, that's uh, what I envision as well happening. And it's going to happen. Absolutely. 
in our situation, we had the best surgeon at Shands. Yeah. And he ended up having an eye problem right after he had scheduled oh, her surgery, and he could not do any surgeries. And we had to use his assistant, the guy that was training under him, which was great. Mm hmm but we felt a little, a little scary. That's a, a little scary. scary and a little cheated because yeah. here we had the best. Yes. What's up with this? Yes. You know, and now you, with this technology, you have access to, to the best of the best worldwide. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. that's, that's, it's, it's a technology is a beautiful thing. It's done a lot of great things too, especially yeah. in the healthcare sector. So yeah. I'm looking forward to, uh, to dive down into that and, and, uh, and enjoy it. Let's say, uh, students that have found out they, uh, in, let's say middle school through college, they have found out they've uh, gotten cancer they f or they found out one of their siblings has or their mom or their dad. You know, it's one thing to have a sibling have cancer. It's another thing to have mom and dad, your security. Yeah. Tell me what you would say to help maybe a student now, now that you've gone through all these different things in your life, what are a couple of things maybe that you would say to the to students going through this now? They've just found out. Yeah. So, you know, a big thing that I had, and it was real important to, uh, you know, because obviously, um, you know, like in my case, whatever, my parents, like we said, were my biggest fans. And, uh, and gosh, they love me more than anything in this world, and I'm blessed for that. But, you know, even with your family is, you know, they've supported you all these years. Now they're they're at a they're at a standpoint in life where they don't know maybe they're, they're going to live they're going to get a chance to walk their daughter or son down the aisle or you know and things of that nature, so it was really important for me because I got kind of bitter at times and even kind of almost even though I was bitter I kind of took it out on my mom so mm -hmm. even in hindsight I think even now when she got you know hit with the breast cancer on that side where it, it's important to to kind of support them as well and and let them know that you're there for them and it's going to be okay and you love them and no matter what now if you're if you know you're fortunate like you know we are to be strong in our faith and things of that nature i couldn't imagine tackling this out tackling my situation or my mom doing hers without our faith um, but that uh, was a crucial um, driver of, of giving us peace but uh, the support was huge uh, and that doesn't happen often you know some especially with kids yes you know they'll they're so upset and the parents so upset and the mm -hmm. parents trying to you know yeah uh, you know basically console them and get them better but uh, really the parent is dying inside I can only imagine as well um, yes. so that type yeah. of support I think would be really good for the family side and don't be afraid to talk to somebody um, you know, I, I'm one of those ones who kind of closed up and, you know, I know I've been talking a lot now, but usually I don't, I, when I was younger, I didn't talk much. I didn't express my feelings, um, cause it wasn't a manly thing to do. Right. Exactly. So exactly. for the men on that side, it's okay. It's okay to open up and talk to people. Um, you know, I talked uh, a lot of times my dad and I had really good conversations as, you know, men one-on-one -on, -one on, uh, you know, things of that nature. And, um, and speaking to, you know, it could be that mentor that you said you talked about. It's great to have mentors. That one person that you know that is just going to sit there and listen and love on you and help give you good advice going forward. Uh, that, 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 that helped me out. And I think that would, that would be the best approach if someone got hit with that. What are the things people said to you that you just wanted to hit them? Yeah. So, um, I think it was, um, uh, I'm trying to think, uh, what I think it was, <laughs> someone, I think someone one time asked, or it was someone asked, uh, when they ask a question or whatever, is when we talk about like mom having cancer or whatever, and this was right at the point or whatever, and someone just came out, I, I don't even remember who it was, and it, it, it kind of rubbed me the wrong way, but you know, obviously I was very emotional at the time, or whatever, they said, well, you know, is she, is she going to die? How long does she have to live? So they had said something like that wow. in, in those lines or whatever. Cause, and mm -hmm. I was like, well, like, you know, instead of just kind of listening to me and explain like everything and how, what the situation is, uh, that kind of said that. And it, it kind of, you know, obviously rubbed me the wrong way a little bit. And, uh, you know, so one of those things, I mean, I think is, is to be, to pull yourself away, be, if you're the opposite end of someone sharing that with you, mm -hmm. just to sit and not say anything and listen. And, and, you know, we can do a lot. We can learn a lot if we just sit and listen. And, Absolutely. Uh, and so that individual, I think, you know, that would be one of the things that, you know, kind of kind of irritated me a little bit. But besides that, no, I mean, I had I was I've been so blessed, Doug, with so many great friends and family from Eustace to Mount Dora, Umatilla, Tavares, Apopka. I mean, all in all over the country, quite frankly, all over the world yeah. uh, when I got sick at that point, because we came in contact with people from Europe and mm -hmm. Dubai, Abu Dhabi, all those areas. Yeah. And um Everybody was just so supportive, man. And I can't even explain to you as, as you know, Facebook's a big age now, right? So everybody right. reaching out on Facebook and just saying, man, we're praying for you. And just to hear that, 
um, I didn't really experience too many bad moments. Mm, um, as, as we said, it was uh, mainly was all good. And just knowing that you had all those people rooting for you in your corner, mm-hmm. I mean, gives you all the peace in the world. Well, the big thing that you said, though, was this. There's the words aren't as po- important as your presence. Correct. And listening. You're needing to get things out. Yes. And you're not needing to consume more information. The over- information is overload. Yeah. You're already overloaded. Yep. Just the fact that somebody says your mom's got cancer. Boom. Yeah. Overload. Computer shut down. You know, yep. you're going into another exactly. mode. You're going survival mode. Yes. And so uh, there's a there's a gal on TED Talks. I don't know if you've heard of TED I've Talks. Heard of TED I'm Talks. sure oh, you yeah, have. Of course, yeah. And uh, uh, TED Talks are really great. They're either really stupid or really great. Depends on which one you listen to. But this one, this lady came out, beautiful lady with shorts on, real short shorts. And I'm going, that's inappropriate. Yeah. And she starts talking about being a runner and different things like that. And her thing is telling people how to help people that are going through tragedies. Mm -hmm. And she was one of the Boston Marathon runners when the bomb went off. She lost her leg. You couldn't tell. She had a great prosthetic on. She wore the short shorts to show that, you know, she looked normal, but she wasn't normal. That's incredible. And she said, my best friend is no longer my best friend because she came up one time. She says, you need to just get over it. Wow. She said, yeah. Stupidest thing she could have ever said. That tops it right there. That tops the charts right there. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) Made me so angry. And she said, I didn't know that she was going through something at the time. And that's why I ask you those things. Because I remember even as youth pastor with kids going through uh, cancer with their parents, parents going through the death of students, different things like that. Uh, I I can think back of a handful of stupid things I said. Now, I also knew what not to say to some degree. But you also are going through a learning process yourself on the other end of being the comforting friend. Yes. yes. So, so uh, yeah, exactly on that side there. And it was, uh, you know, as far as, like you said, the listening and the presence, you know, may, means, uh, means a lot on that side. Who so. listened best to you? Uh, Do you remember someone that just is kind of like a big piece um, in, on any, and you know, you got a whole few, a lot of years here for your mom's cancer to your cancer and to her new cancer. Was there something that stood out that there was um, that so one yeah, person? So I, I sh- you know, there were a lot of uh, a lot of moments. Uh, my uncle uh, is very important in my life, and um, him and I are. It's it's funny. We we're just kind of like cut of the same cloth. Though. We think yeah. a lot alike. Yeah. Um, and and uh, analyze things mm-hmm. a lot alike. And you know, I reached out to him a lot on some tough issues that I was going through. My brother as well. Uh, who lives in Ohio, mm-hmm. I reached out. He was very supportive, and I would just reach out to some people. So when I had to, when I wanted to love on and reach out on people and mm-hmm. uh, my family and wanted a family perspective and wanted some family, you know, um, counseling, I did that. But as far as outside of that, and, and um, I would say the most uh, person outside of my family would probably be Pastor Rick. Mm-hmm. Rick Pugh was just uh, an incredible individual uh, through this whole entire process. Um, and I can see that. Rick is a man who has gone through extreme pains mm-hmm. in his life. Yes. What's the name of his foundation again? This Hope Foundation. This Hope can, Foundation. Uh, yep, thishopefoundation.org. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you can see it. You can see what the uh, the cause is. It's, it's a really, really big cause, really, really concerning numbers that mm-hmm. uh, pertain to divorce rates and things of that nature, especially mm-hmm. with families that are dealing with childs that are d- disabled as well as the passing the loss of a child mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so that's uh, you know those are those are very very like we said topics those are very you know topics that you want to kind of tippy toe around especially with families but there's a lot of families out there that suffer suffer from that and and just really they have no hope so we want to give them hope yeah and and those are the the people who have gone through those kind of tragedies are the people that can speak to those kind of tragedies exactly. and I, and i know that uh, rick and his wife lost a child yes at one point and his name gone, was chad actually oh really and he and he passed of leukemia oh my so him and i had a no a wonder pretty, you guys had a real close we re- had a pretty yeah. close relationship exactly yeah uh, there's a lot of help out there yes so tell us how they can get in touch with you so yeah so you can go on the uh like i said the uh the, this hope uh this hope foundation on that side is um you can go at thishopefoundation.org 
to check out the website, and then you can see all about the the foundation. Obviously, Rick and Gina, um, their focus is on you know dealing with families that have lo- you know lost a child or mm-hmm. dealing with disabled children. Um, I'm also going to have an outreach for um, individuals, uh, especially you know younger individuals that get hit with the cancer, you know the cancer on that side of thing, and that yes. that they hit get hit with that adversity on a young age, and how to you know try to cope and deal and how what things that I did and what helped me and you know you brought a good thing up as far as um, you know we've said it a few times the uh, the word help mm-hmm. and a lot of us you know a lot of us don't like to ask for help mm-hmm. especially when it comes to emotional issues right yeah, emotional absolutely. things I think that's one of the things especially us men uh, the last thing we want to do is tell anybody that we're feeling sad or depressed or angry or whatever the case yes. is we'll react away but we won't really communicate so I think that is a, a really um, a big thing that we're trying to do and, and trying to is say there's nothing wrong with asking for help. Absolutely nothing wrong with it. Mm-hmm. So at the end of the day, that's what we want to try to do with those families and other individuals across the board. Lauren Pugh, Rick's daughter. Yes. She does one. Uh, she's uh, she does one. She's uh, she does the great things within their community uh, with. She's really loves the little kids mm-hmm. and um, dressed up as superhero. And yeah. I don't know if you've ever seen pictures of her and her dad. Oh, I know. Superman. And she'll no, be, I know, haven't seen that yet. Su- but Lauren yeah. is amazing. Oh, person. Yeah. yeah. So she yeah. does a lot of great things. So she's part of it in that outreach, too. So mm-hmm. but the best way to do is to go on the website. You can also, like I said, that book, this uh, this hope, the book you can get on Amazon. It's a wonderful story, um, but it'll also give you a lot of inspiration as well Mm -hmm. so that's what uh that's what we're planning on doing i think god's leading us in the direction has led rick and spoke to rick and gina and i feel that uh you know it's it's gonna it's gonna be great that's great that's great and uh, anyway people can can get in touch with you uh personally if they want to send you an email yeah of course like i'm i'm wide open with everything i mean my email is chad.canfield at gmail.com that's my personal email Uh, are you better at email are you emails your best thing yeah yeah, emails emails probably the best and most efficient way on that side and i'm uh, you're in the world of finance email has to be a good thing yes it is exactly (laughs) right right. exactly and uh you know even if they want to hear um you know more about you know our company. It's virtualhealthsolution.com. dot com. Mm-hmm. More about telemedicine side, but um, email. I'd love to take any questions. Um, you know, grab coffee. Anybody that's having any issues, struggling, whatever, just wants to hear more about my story. Or I would love to to, to help out. I mean, that's honestly. I mean, my testimony. When I look back, a lot of people say, "Chad." You know, what would you change? I know, like, if you could rewind it or you could have a wish and just say, hey, no more cancer, whatever. No way. Without a doubt, and I can say 100% with my heart that mm. I'm glad that this happened and I'm blessed. It wasn't fun, but it just gave me such a better perspective on life and my friends, my family, the experiences that I have. You cherish them so much more when you're faced with death and, uh, and you're fortunate enough to beat it. So, I mean, that's that's that's, uh, you know, one thing that I definitely want to make that, you know, I wouldn't take it back. You see, and that that's very important for people to see because we're going through those tragedies uh, um, and those things in our life. You know, life happens. We're in this world. This is not the way God intended this world to be, that he gave us free will. Yes. And so a lot of things come out of it that that he didn't intend, but he knew all along. You know, just like parents know kids are going to make mistakes, but they have kids anyway. Yeah. Children. And And for my Christian, for my Christian brothers and sisters, I tell them basically thing is one thing that how I looked at it. It's so hard, especially if you lose someone that this this tangible life that we have here is what we is what hurts to lose. And you think Mm -hmm. about all the memories and everything. But what's in store for us is eternity. And when you when you can actually put and I know it sounds easier said than done, but we can you can actually put those together and say, okay, I get it. Mm -hmm. Like this isn't this isn't a big deal. Our tangible life here is not what it's all about. It's all about being a better human being. And then, you know. God willing, I know where I'm going uh, as far as for eternity. That's where it's at. So, I mean, uh, that that helped me, and it helped my family as well. So, uh, I think C.S. Lewis said pain's the megaphone God uses yeah. to get our attention. It sure does. He sure does. Yeah. Yep. And so, yes, sir. Chad, thank you so much for thank being here so today. Thank you so much. I say, appreciate say the opportunity. Goodbye. Absolutely. Say goodbye to Youth Worker Nation. Yes, sir. Goodbye. Appreciate you guys listening. All right. Thank you. Youth Worker Nation, we're out of here. Uh, this is Youth Worker on Fire with uh, Doug Edwards. And keep looking for these episodes. We're going to have more and more of them on. Look for Chad's episode. Pass it on to other people. Remember, you can find us on social media. You can support us through Patreon. And uh, Youth Worker Nation, keep going. Keep moving. Keep shaking. Don't give up. Uh, It's a marathon. It's not a sprint. It's not a sprint. We're out of here. Amen. Appreciate it, buddy. 
Absolutely. Thanks, man. brother. I really appreciate you. Oh, me too. We appreciate you. That was